Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome back to my channel. My name is Paul. Here was another Napoleon video, of course, because we've been on like a long Napoleon run. Uh, sorry, just apologize about my talking with my teeth right now. But anyways, uh, let's get to Napoleon. Uh, 1813, the road to Leipzig, where we last, sorry, where we last left off. Uh, with Napoleon, he, he was running for his life, but his, like, tail between his legs, like, he definitely underestimated just the Russians in general of, like, I guess, what to expect from them as an enemy and how they didn't just, you know, you know, bow down, you know, come, you know, come on their knees and say, okay, we give up, you won. No, Russia, Russia wasn't going down like that, and, uh, basically chased them all the way back to France, all the way back to Paris. And what gets worse is he's only had 20,000 men. 20,000. He had like half a million men start that campaign off. More than that, to start their campaign off going to uh, Russia. So that's just huge. Like, I know it's the point here, and I know there's like more episodes left after it. Excuse me episodes left after this one so i know he's not i know he's not done he has twenty thousand men left so he he's gonna have to like he has to rally those troops like he's gonna have to put out some letters and try to make more alliances or i don't know he, he's he's got to get more people to fight for him and i'm not sure how he's gonna do that at all um because he looks like he has a bunch of, you know, a bunch of enemies just ready to, like, pounce on him because get them while they're down, right? If you're going to get in the point, now is the time. Uh, so, uh, yes, uh, Road to Lipstick. I don't know what that is or where. I'm sorry. I don't know where that is. I'm sorry. I'm obviously going to find out. Uh So, yeah, let's check this out. Let's see. Napoleon has to have something up his sleeve. Has to. You know. He's not done yet. Napoleon's not going down like that. This war, this, you know, a series ain't going down like that. And so, oh, let's do it. Got another long video ahead of us, guys. I'm rocking the apple juice today. <laughs> and uh, let's, uh, let's do it. Let's do it, guys. Before we do, please hit that like and subscribe, guys. Please and thank you. And uh, let's get to it. By the way, this is from... Uh, Epic History TV, for those who don't know, an amazing channel. Go check that out. I've done a lot of their stuff. Done Crusades, Alexander the Great. I'm doing this amazing series. But anyways, let's get to this. Dun -dun, full screen. Yeah. 1812 had been a disastrous year for Napoleon. His invasion of Russia had led to the almost total destruction of an army of half a million men. Yep. Now Poland and Germany were wide open to Russian attack. Some advised Emperor Alexander that this was the time to make a favorable peace with Napoleon. Russia's own armies had been mauled, and Western Russia devastated. But Alexander was determined to see Napoleon defeated for good, to free Europe from his clutches, and avenge Moscow's destruction by taking Paris. Uh -oh. Napoleon's allies were deserting him. Prussian troops had already agreed a truce with the Russians. Yeah. Schwarzenberg's corps marched back to Austria, which assumed a policy of watchful neutrality. Napoleon had left Marshal Murat in charge of the remnants of the army, but he left for the Kingdom of Naples, hoping to cut a deal with the Allies that would let him keep his throne. Hmm. He was replaced by Napoleon's stepson, Eugène, who'd proved himself a brave and able soldier in Russia, but was unused to independent command and now faced yeah. odds of four to one. Wow. 
as Russian forces advanced through Poland, he continued to retreat west, leaving garrisons to hold strategic fortresses, most of which were soon besieged. Okay. On the 7th of February, Russian troops entered Warsaw unopposed. Napoleon's Polish client state, the Duchy of Warsaw, effectively ceased to exist. Three weeks later, Russian troops entered Berlin, while Sweden joined the Allies. Oh. Sweden was ruled by Napoleon's former Marshal Bernadotte, now officially known as Crown Prince Karl Johann. Many would accuse him of betraying Napoleon, right. but he'd always been clear that once he became Sweden's Crown Prince, he'd pursue Swedish interests, which is what he now claimed to do. Yeah. In exchange for Norway, to be taken from France's ally, Denmark, and one million pounds from Britain, Bernadotte agreed to join what was now the sixth coalition against France since the revolution, with an army of 30,000 troops. Wow. Ten days later, King Frederick William of Prussia declared war on France. It followed yeah. weeks of indecision. The king was widely seen as a weak character and terrified of Napoleon. But with guarantees of Russian military support, the return of lost territory, and enormous financial and material aid from Britain, he agreed to field an army of 80,000 men. Okay. On the 17th of March, he issued a proclamation to the people of Prussia and Germany. And mein Volk, to my people, summoning them to fight for Prussia and Germany's honor in what would soon be known as the German War of Liberation. Hmm. The Prussian army had been greatly reformed since its humiliating defeat to Napoleon in 1806. A military commission headed by General von Scharnhorst had sacked nearly 200 old generals and abolished flogging, expanded recruitment, and introduced exams for officers, and overhauled training, tactics, and drill. Okay. When Napoleon met the new Prussian army in battle two months later, he remarked, these animals have learned something. <laughs> Small consolation, they'd learned most of it from him. Right. This video is sponsored by Curiosity. So you got all the, uh, just the allies, as you call them, uh, joining forces. Like, they're ready. Like, they don't want Napoleon to get power back. They're just ready to, for it to be done with, this war to be done with. Everyone go, everybody can go along, you know, back to their regular lives and this war should be done. They don't want him to, you know, build up another army and, you know, make another push for more campaigns. So, yeah. Stream, home of more than two and a half thousand online documentaries exploring science, technology, the natural world, and of course, history. For sponsoring this video. Yeah, it's all gone, man. You gotta start over. As his enemies massed in Germany, Napoleon was in Paris, working tirelessly to build a new army with which to face them. All right, what you got? 137,000 new conscripts joined the army, and laws passed to call up 100,000 more. Okay. While 40,000 okay. veterans from the army in Spain, 16,000 Marines, and 80,000 men of the National Guard a home defense force, were transferred to Germany. Huh. The new conscripts were nicknamed Marie-Louises, after Napoleon's young wife, who passed the new conscription laws in his absence. They were young and raw. Two-thirds were teenagers, and there was a severe lack of experienced officers and NCOs. In short, the countless irreplaceable veterans now lying beneath Russian soil. There was also a critical shortage of cavalry, a crisis mocked by British satirists. It would take Napoleon longer 
to replace the many thousands of horses and trained horsemen who perished in Russia. When Napoleon left... Yeah, he thought all, you know, green men, like, they're basically, you got a bunch of rookies going against, you know, basically all these guys from Russia, all these guys, you know, they know what they're doing, so I'm just going to have some kind of awesome boot camp to get these guys in action, or maybe look at a couple of little skirmishes together, a couple of small battles, one, you know, get their feet wet, I don't know, I guess we'll find out. Well, he... He's got some men now. He's got some men, you yeah. know. ...who perished in Russia. Yeah, all the horses. When Napoleon left Paris for Germany in mid-April, the French situation was precarious. Eugène had been forced back behind the river Elbe to the fortified city of Magdeburg. Dresden, the capital of Saxony, had fallen to the Prussians. The Duchy of Mecklenburg-Schwerin became the first German state to defect from Napoleon's Confederation of the Rhine. Mm. Russian Cossacks raided as far as Hamburg, inspiring local revolts against French occupying forces. Meanwhile, Austria stood on the sidelines, so far declining mm. to back either side. Okay, okay. Napoleon's miraculous feat of organization meant he now had more than 200,000 troops in Germany. And the emperor's personal magnetism was undimmed. The morale of his army was high. The Russians, on the other hand, lost their iconic commander, Field Marshal Kutuzov, to pneumonia on the 28th of April. His role was taken over by General Wittgenstein. Russian troops were exhausted and far from home. Their army weakened by the need to contain French garrisons across Poland and Germany. Prussia and Sweden had yet to fully mobilize their strength, and Allied forces barely mustered 100,000 men. They were now heavily outnumbered by Napoleon. Wow. The French emperor decided to strike quickly. Just like he that, ordered huh? Marshal Davout to Hamburg with 35,000 men to secure his northern flank. He would march against the Russian and Prussian forces converging on Leipzig to force a decisive battle. Victory would make Austria think twice about joining the Allies, allow him to rescue the 90,000 men trapped in garrisons across Germany and Poland, and re-establish his dominance over Europe. Okay. It's true. As Napoleon advanced on Leipzig, the Allies faced a predicament. To risk battle against Napoleon's larger army, or give up Germany without a fight, a potentially devastating blow to Allied morale and any chance of winning Austria over to their cause. Allied headquarters made the bold decision to attack. Oh. They knew most of Napoleon's army was made up of raw conscripts, that their own troops were better trained and had a great superiority in cavalry and artillery. Right, makes sense. The Allies agreed that as That's... Napoleon crossed the Sala River, they would hit his right flank before he could concentrate the full mass of his forces. The two armies were on a collision course, but Napoleon's shortage of cavalry meant he lacked information about Allied movements. On the 1st of May, Marshal Bessier, commanding the cavalry in Murat's absence, was carrying out reconnaissance himself when he was hit by a cannonball. He killed wow. instantly. Damn. Bessier was the second of Napoleon's marshals to be killed in action, and like Lan, an old comrade and trusted friend. The Allies were able to surprise Napoleon, falling on Marshal Ney's third corps near Lutzen. Ney's troops had to cling on in the face of a Russian and Prussian onslaught, while Napoleon rapidly redirected his other corps to fall on the enemy's flanks. 
one stage, Napoleon had to personally help rally routing troops as they broke in the face of determined Prussian assaults. Yeah, new but guys. on the whole, his young conscripts fought with courage. And despite hours of savage fighting, Wittgenstein could not exploit his early advantage. As French reinforcements arrived, the battle turned against him. Here you go. Towards dusk, the Allies were forced to break off the engagement. Though they'd inflicted around 22,000 casualties, losing just half as many men. Okay. General von Scharnhorst, mortally wounded, was among them. Crucially, Napoleon's lack of cavalry meant he was unable to pursue the enemy, who retreated in good order. Expecting the Prussians to fall back on Berlin, Napoleon sent Marshal Ney in pursuit, while he continued east. Okay. But the Allied army stayed together, withdrawing to a defensive position at Bautzen, deliberately close to the Austrian border, uh -oh. hoping to entice Schwarzenberg to intervene, and daring Napoleon to violate Austrian neutrality. Wow. Neither happened. Instead, Napoleon ordered Ney to swing south to fall on the Allies' northern flank, while he launched a frontal assault to pin them in place. Okay, how does this work? The battle lasted two days, as French infantry struggled forward against the Prussian and Russian lines. But a misunderstanding over Ney's orders caused a delay that allowed the Allies to narrowly escape Napoleon's trap. Oh. Once more, the Allies fought with great determination and inflicted many more losses than they suffered. There were more casualties. So I'm already surprised because the point is pushing through and he's, uh, you know, he's, he's pushing through, he's gaining, he's winning. Winning these battles, I guess, but the casualties, like, he, he's got to, that's got to be, like, flipped. He's got to win these battles and have that be flipped and give more casualties, casualties to them. Um, I don't like that. Come on, Napoleon. There were more casualties during the pursuit, including the next day, General Duroc, Grand Marshal of the Palace, responsible for Napoleon's personal arrangements and his closest surviving friend. Riding with Napoleon's staff, a freak cannon shot ricocheted off a tree and disemboweled him. His slow, painful death deeply upset Napoleon. Damn. Damn. The Emperor Damn. continued his pursuit to Breslau, once again hindered by his lack of experienced cavalry, while Oudinot was sent north to take Berlin but was held at Luckau by von Bülow's Prussian Corps. On the 2nd of June, with both sides strained to breaking point, neutral Austria proposed a ceasefire, which, to the surprise of many, Napoleon accepted. Huh. The armistice of Plaswitz would last more than two months, a period of intense diplomacy and military mobilization by both sides. Napoleon wanted time to rebuild his cavalry, a shortage of which had allowed the Allies to escape twice. But he also wanted to keep Austria on side, which he feared might join the Allies with 200,000 troops. Even though Emperor Francis I was now his father-in-law, since Napoleon's marriage to his daughter, Marie-Louise, in 1810. Austrian Foreign Minister Clemens von Metternich, who'd become one of 19th century Europe's most influential statesmen, now took center stage. Metternich wanted peace and to see Austria restored as a great European power, which meant Napoleon contained, but not crushed, which would hand too much power to Russia. In June, he traveled to Dresden to ask Napoleon to make concessions, 
while promising the Allies that if he did not, Austria would join them. But Napoleon dismissed Metternich's terms out of hand. Wow. He would not return the Illyrian provinces to Austria, agree to the repartition of Poland, or the breakup of the Confederation of the Rhine. All were out of the question. Napoleon famously threw his hat to the ground in fury. Peace and war lie in your majesty's hands, Metternich is said to have warned him. Yeah. Today you can still make peace. Tomorrow it may be too late. But Napoleon... Oh shit, never mind. We finished this sentence here before I should... Peace. Tomorrow it may be too late. But Napoleon preferred war to what he called a humiliating peace. So yeah, I mean, uh, Austria was staying neutral, you know, and uh, obviously Napoleon was happy with that. I mean, uh, the Russians, I guess the, uh, the Allies weren't really happy with that because, you know, Napoleon is pushing forward and kind of, you know, has got some momentum going. And Austria, it's like, was holding, holding the cards, hey, you know, it's a good idea. Hey, like, yeah, we'll, we'll keep it in peace. Just give us our stuff back and do this and that. Napoleon's, uh, I figured maybe Napoleon might give away on maybe part of that if Austria would have took it. Like, okay, you can have this, but we're not doing this, you know, kind of like, you know, make, just making a deal, you know, we'll, we'll, you know, we'll come halfway. But I guess not, but damn, now you, now you have to deal with another giant country if Austria just, just joins the Allies. 200,000 men. Ugh, Napoleon, you got... But, but, you know, Napoleon, he might come out of this. He might come out of this. Maybe he'll make a last second deal. We'll watch. We'll find out. Hmm. On the 12th of August, 1813, Austria joined the Sixth Coalition and declared war on France. Yeah. The Allies now had a numerical advantage of three to two, and a new strategy, the Trachenberg Plan. Recognizing Napoleon's genius, the Allies would avoid battle with the Emperor and instead target his marshals, threaten his flanks, and wear down French forces, huh. until it was time to close in for the kill. Over the next few months, the coalition would also receive massive material support from Britain, including eight million pounds in silver and gold coin, 200 cannon with transport, 120,000 firearms, 18 million rounds of ammunition, 23,000 barrels of gunpowder, 30,000 swords and sabers, wow. 150,000 uniforms, 175,000 pairs of boots, 1.5 million pounds of beef, biscuit, and flour. Damn! 28,000 gallons of rum and brandy. Yeah, and like, if you're the troops on the Allies, Britain sends Britain send the stuff over. Like, you're like, damn, we got goodies. I got, I got like, a new uniform. I'm now eating good. I'm getting paid. Uh, I got my new guns. Like, you're feeling good. Like, you're feeling successful right now if you're on the Allies because... <laughs> Probably through that all that cold and crap, you're probably feeling like crap. Probably got some you know, holes in your boots, and you're not, you know, your, your equipment is just not up to par. And now you've just been blessed with, uh, you know, some awesome, you know, some more new gear and stuff. So that for morale, that had I had to feel pretty good. Of course, Britain, you know, Britain, and France don't get along. So Britain's like, yeah, whatever you guys need you to, you know, take over France, you know, take take Napoleon down, take whatever you need. Like, damn. All right, Napoleon. 8,000 oh, gallons of rum and brandy. Here you go. The total value of British aid to the coalition in 1813 was 11.3 million pounds. Today, worth around half a billion dollars. Wow. Napoleon, meanwhile, had turned Dresden into a major supply depot and strengthened his cavalry arm though it remained a pale shadow of its glorious past. 
Murat returned to lead it, his secret approach to the Allies having been rebuffed. But when news arrived of King Joseph's disastrous defeat to Wellington's Anglo-Spanish-Portuguese army yeah. at the Battle of Victoria, Napoleon had to send Marshal Soult, one of his best commanders, to salvage the situation. Hmm. On the 15th of August, Napoleon left Dresden and advanced against what he considered the most urgent threat the joint Prussian-Russian army of Silesia, commanded by General Gebhard von Blücher, soon to win the nickname Marshal Vorwärts, Marshal Forwards, for his aggressive leadership. But Blücher followed the new plan and retreated when he learned of Napoleon's advance. Okay. Napoleon then received news from Marshal Saint-Serre, holding Dresden with 20,000 men that Schwarzenberg's gigantic army of Bohemia was approaching, wow. and the city and its supplies were in danger. Napoleon left Marshal Macdonald to keep an eye on Blücher, and raced back to Dresden, sending Van Damme's first corps to threaten Schwarzenberg's communications. It's By the time around. the Allied assault began, Enough reinforcements had arrived to fight off the attack. There we go. The next day, despite being heavily outnumbered, Napoleon ordered a counterattack. Struggling through mud and heavy rain, Marshal Murat's advance, supported by Victor's second corps, broke the Allied left flank and took 13,000 prisoners. Wow! Damn! The Allies had suffered a disastrous defeat because they'd ignored their own rule. Don't take on Napoleon in battle. But you news see, soon arrived that turned the situation... You see all of the big comparison and deaths right there? Like, damn it. And they said they broke their own rule. Do not fight Napoleon in battle. Napoleon... Is like a strategic master. He's going to figure a way to make the odds in his favor. And so if you stuck with the plan, just kind of like nitpick around Napoleon and, you know, these the smaller forces. And then at the end of the day, when, we, when all, all those are gone, Napoleon's on his own, they just then go for him. But, and, but like, it's going to be hard for Napoleon to be everywhere, man, because he, he can't be everywhere. So be tough, man. You gotta jump around, Napoleon. You gotta jump around. There, there it is. Damn, that's a big difference. See, those are the kind of victories Napoleon needs. Napoleon kicking butt. Napoleon in battle. But news soon arrived that turned the situation on its head. Marshal Oudinot had resumed his advance on Berlin with 66,000 men. But in three days of heavy combat around Grossbiren, he was defeated by Bernadotte's Army of the North. Some of the most savage fighting was between Napoleon's Saxon allies and von Bülow's Prussians, hmm. two German states that for now remained on opposing sides. Three days later, at the Katzbach River, Blücher inflicted a crushing defeat on Marshal Macdonald driving some French troops into the river itself. Macdonald lost 30,000 men, three eagles and 100 guns, for Blücher's 22,000 casualties. Three days after Napoleon's victory at Dresden, as Van Damme's corps pursued the Allies, it became trapped in wooded valleys around Kulm and was overrun. General Van Damme himself was dragged from his horse by Cossacks, as he and 10,000 of his men were made prisoner. Napoleon sent Ney to take over from Oudinot, who engaged Bülow's Prussian corps at Denevitz. The Prussians, fighting to save Berlin, held their own, until Russian and Swedish reinforcements arrived to turn the battle decisively in the Allies' favor. Ney's retreat became a rout, 
with the loss of another 22,000 men. Napoleon's brilliant victory at Dresden had been completely overturned in just 10 days. Wow. The Allied plan was working. Napoleon became increasingly frustrated as Allied armies withdrew wherever he advanced and advanced wherever he was not. Mm -hmm. You're pulling them away. teenage conscripts were exhausted by constant marching and famished as Saxony had been stripped bare of supplies. Thousands fell sick, thousands more deserted. Russian and Prussian light troops were now operating behind Napoleon's army, harassing his communications with France. Many of Napoleon's marshals advised him to pull back to the River Rhine. But Napoleon wasn't giving up Germany without a fight. And we're just like pulling the point one direction and attacking them in the other direction. By October 1813, Napoleon faced a third of a million Allied troops in Germany, converging on him from three directions. 900 miles away, Field Marshal Wellington was crossing the Bidassoa River into France, the first enemy army on French soil in nearly 20 years. While the Kingdom of Bavaria, a French ally since the days of Austerlitz, had secretly agreed to switch sides and would declare war on France on the 14th of October. Mm. Napoleon planned to defend the line of the River Elbe. But the arrival of General Bennigsen's reserve Russian army freed up Blücher, who suddenly marched to join forces with Bernadotte and forced his way across the Elbe at Wartenberg. Napoleon went north with 150,000 men, seeking the decisive battle that would change his fortunes. But once more, Blücher narrowly escaped him. Staying away. Then came news from Murat, who'd been left with 67,000 men to cover Schwarzenberg. The enemy had bypassed Dresden and was heading for Leipzig. If the city fell, Napoleon would be cut off from France. Once more, he was advised to fall back to the Rhine. But instead, Napoleon ordered all his forces to concentrate at Leipzig. Here we go. He would risk everything in one great battle to decide the fate of his empire and the fate of Europe. Okay, here we go. Thank you to all our Patreon supporters oh, so for making this battle. series possible and to Curiosity we Street for sponsoring this video. The road to Leipzig. Okay, it's not the battle, of course. But damn. Uh, so yeah, just very good tactics on the Allies. You know, you're just fighting, you know, the uh, all his marshals, all uh, Napoleon's marshals staying away from Napoleon himself. And when he comes, you kind of pull Napoleon in one direction and have one of those other armies attack, you know, one of his marshals from the other direction. I mean, it's definitely an awesome genius move. And it's gotten Napoleon frustrated. Like, Napoleon's trying to get a decisive battle to where he can take control. And the Allies are taking it from him. And uh, you get very frustrating stuff for Napoleon. Uh... Well, I guess the next episode is the big battle, I guess. What we got going on here? What's the next episode called? Let's do battle of the Nations. So I guess we're going to have one giant battle of all the nations right here, right now. Or next episode. So yeah, that definitely looks like what's going to be going down. Uh, so yeah, I guess, you know, we'll see what happens, guys. We'll see what happens. Um... Um, uh, the series is almost over, just in the fact that I, uh, I know that. I, I just think that I don't know if Napoleon is Napoleon. So, it can, does he have his last victory? 
Yeah, if he's putting all his forces in right now to turn the tide, then if he lost this, this would be the last video, right? It would be the last video to be done. So I'm expecting, now I'm expecting Napoleon victory. He's going to pull this out and uh, say, don't fight Napoleon head on. And that's exactly what they're about to do. So Napoleon is going to show his genius and, you know, prove why they just stuck to their plan and not took on Napoleon. So I'm expecting that. I'm expecting Napoleon to come up out on top. Uh, the next uh, video. But yeah, awesome, awesome videos. Uh, epic history never disappoints. So uh, check them out. And definitely please hit the like and subscribe here, guys. Help me out a lot, please, and thank you. And uh, I'll definitely catch you guys in future videos. Having a lot of fun with this. Napoleon series, guys. Man, we've been going on a you know on a run here, man. But it looks like we have like a couple more episodes left, it looks like. But any, well, actually that's all the marshals and stuff to do. But anyways, uh yeah, thank you guys for watching. Like and subscribe. And I'll definitely catch you guys in future videos. Thank you.